and welcome to UO Today. I'm Barbara Altman, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guests today are Bryna Goodman and Mark Buder. Goodman is Professor of Modern Chinese History, Director of the Asian Studies Program, and Executive Director of the UO's Confucius Institute. Buder is Director of Opera Studies at the University of Notre Dame and the General Director of the Eugene Opera. The Eugene Opera will premiere a new production of Nixon in China, March 16th and 18th, 2012. Buder will sing the role of Chairman Mao. The opera production is the centerpiece of a month-long reflection on the 40th anniversary of Richard Nixon's historic journey to China. In conjunction with the opera and in recognition of the 40th anniversary, Goodman is teaching a class during winter 2012 called What Opera Can Do for History, Nixon in China, in History and on Stage. The class was developed as part of a teaching fellowship, the Coleman Guiteau Fellowship, which is, comes from the Oregon Humanities Center. Bryna and Mark, welcome. Good Thanks to be for here. taking Thank the you. time to talk to us. Bryna, you're the historian. Would you start us off with a little a historical context surrounding the uh, trip that Nixon made to China in 1972 and its importance? Sure. Uh, well, uh, if Many of your viewers won't remember back to this time, but it's still within my lifetime. After several decades of no communication, uh, non mutual non-recognition uh, between the U.S. and China, uh, a plan was conceived. Uh, really, efforts uh, were made on both sides to begin a, a process of rapprochement. It was difficult because there, was, there had been no communication for decades. Notes were passed through Pakistan. Uh, Kissinger made a secret trip uh, in 1971, and the result was uh, the Nixon-Kissinger trip in 1972, which really made headlines uh, around the world, uh, and was an extraordinary confrontation between very different personalities with very different um, uh, notions of the world, uh, but coming together in recognition that this was uh, clearly uh, needed uh, for um, uh, the future of global interactions, a very historic moment. Uh, and it has, in fact, had um, big consequences for international relations between the countries, right? Well, there's a book um, uh, by Margaret Macmillan which uses the title, The Week That Changed the World. Um, the consequences are momentous. Uh, China today wasn't foreseeable then. Uh, looking back in retrospect at this moment, uh, it's really quite extraordinary, a, a moment of prescience uh, in, a, in a sense. Uh, and I think that also adds to the um, allure of the opera. Uh, it's, it's remarkable the way in which the opera enables you to look back, reimagine this moment, and the, this odd constellation of personalities uh, that really uh, were involved. Mark, I have to ask you, I've heard you speak about this, and I'd like you to talk about it now, if you would. How unusual is it for opera to pick up on a, an historical event that is still memorable to many of those who will be in the audience? Well, it's, it's unusual for opera to pick up on um, a historical event. It, it, it's unusual for us to have a docu-opera, which is, is kind of what Nixon in China has been up until this point, and it's, it's a subgenre of opera that John Adams specializes in. Uh, he's written The Death of Klinghoffer, which was based on historical um, works, uh, a historical event, and actually an event that we all, it, it's, I find it odd to even refer to it as a historical event. I still think of that as current events. Uh, Nixon in China, of course, made a tremendous impression on, on my generation, on our generation. And, um, but in, so, the idea of transferring actual historical figures of the time to the operatic stage is, is a little unusual. Um, we have to remember when we look at the opera canon, the, the sort of received works, that they're remote to us, but they're not necessarily remote to the, to the time of their composition. Um, Carmen, our other opera uh, of this year now, is, is, takes place in sort of romantic, Spain that never existed for us, but at the time of its composition, it was it was pretty contemporary. And um, a work that's on my mind, as far as this is concerned, is Traviata, which is a work, of course, that 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 is central to to any opera house's repertoire. Uh, we now, I'm not sure how we look at it now, but we don't look at it as a story of 
a sex worker who dies of the 19th century equivalent of AIDS, but that's in fact what it is, and that's certainly what it was when it was new. Um, it was based on a Dumas story, and uh, which was based, which everyone recognized as being a thinly disguised novel of his own life. Um, and um, the first production of Traviata actually, they had to do what we do now. They put it in Never Neverland. They put it in you know sort of a 17th century co uh, costumes because it was too it was too contemporary. So the the opera operas of the 19th century when they were composed were much more immediate than than they are now. And for us to do Nixon in China uh, reestablishes our connection with the the opera public, the arts going public in Eugene, in a way that is much truer to um, history than we we rec recognize. I have a follow up question. The the opera um, premiered in 1987 mm -hmm. in Houston. Mm -hmm. That was a lot closer, obviously, to the historical or to the that particular event. Do we need to do it differently in 2012 than it was done in 1987? Um, we do. We do. Um, we, the Eugene we Opera, Eugene, do. Eugene Opera does, and I, uh, for a number of reasons, not the least of which is the passage of time. The passage of time enables us to look at the opera as a work um, with values that are uh, different or above and beyond the original resonance that the work had. Um, in 1987, Nixon and China was in fact ripped from today's headlines pretty much. Um, and now this is 40 years after those events. Um, the uh, participants are either passed on or I think Kissinger is the only major character who's still alive and he's in his late 80s. Um, even for people who remember that time, the emotional response to those historical figures is different than it was. It would have been in 1987 and certainly different than it would have been in 1972. Um, this enables us to do something that hasn't been done before, which is to take a look at the opera, uh, the subtext of the opera, the substory of the opera, the meta story, to see whether we have a psychological drama to go with the docudrama. Um, we're finding that we do. The physical production will uh, reflect that. It won't have the iconic arrival of Air Force One. Um, it will be something different and, and something very exciting. I, I have some comments uh, on that and the passage of time. I think that when the opera first appeared in, in the uh, 1987, right, um, it was very hard to digest because it was too close, very proximate to the events. And uh, I think it was hard especially to get past the rest of the baggage that people had in their minds about Nixon, uh, to think really about this encounter with China. Uh, and I think the passage of time and our new relationship with China uh, reawakens the fascination in that, in that moment of U.S.-China rapprochement. Of course, it, the full rapprochement would take uh, another six years, but that first moment of encounter, I think uh, the passage of time really uh, highlights uh, in the sense. Uh, and um, I think there's also interesting things go on in the opera with gender that I think correspond to new interest in uh, gender with the passage of time. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's very interesting now. In, in our study, in our work on the opera, we find we're drawn very much to Cho Enlai's last speech where he, everything is done. The captains and the kings have departed and he, he says, I'm, I'm old and cannot sleep. And he wonders what will happen from what they have done and was it a, any good or not. And I would expect in 1987 that that was um, in a sense anticlimactic, that by the time people seeing the opera got to that point, they would be so worn out by going, oh, look, there's Nixon. And, you know, does he look like Nixon? Does he sound, you know, and there's Chairman Mao and he's singing, this, you know. That by the time we have this reflective moment at the end, people are ready to be done. Now I think we're going to see that the opera is rebalanced in a way and something is revealed that may not have been seen before. Um, and I think all to the good. When you present this, Brian, I'm thinking particularly about the class you're doing in conjunction with the opera in the winter. You've got a generation of students for whom 
this will not have the impact it does on those of us who were around when the visit took place. How do you set it up for 19, 20, 21 year olds? Well, they will be reading some history. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, these are, you're right, this is a generation that doesn't remember Mal, and they really don't remember Nixon. Uh, so they really need to, but uh, their parents uh, and their grandparents even, uh, will really relate to and remember this time. Uh, so they will be reading quite a bit of history. They'll be also, um, the book actually, th the book, the, the class is as much about um, the interpretation that is involved in history and opera as about the specific events. Uh, so some of what they will encounter in the class isn't particular to the history, but it does involve thinking about um, what we do when we think about history or interpret historical events and how a different um, mode of uh, representation works. And I think that those kinds of large questions are interesting questions that young people don't necessarily come to class thinking about but can engage them uh, immediately. Just bridging or connecting history and opera, imagining such a person as Richard Nixon or Kissinger or Mao, and then what it takes to represent them on stage, I think will immediately uh, connect them to questions about fields or ideas that I hope will draw them in. And then, of course, uh, they'll get to meet with Mark and uh, other performers and hear what it takes to be Mao on stage. So I, I think there's a lot that the students can uh, enjoy and think about. I want to get back to being Chairman Mao on stage, but I wanted to ask you first, the notion of a docu-opera is maybe a great way to help grow this new generation of opera listeners, of, of a generation who can appreciate opera not just as a representation of a fictional bygone romantic era, but something that's relevant to today's world. Is that part of the thinking behind staging this particular opera in Eugene? Well, we're always about new audiences. So that's behind everything. Um, no, I have to say, uh, going back to Chow and Lai's statement about we wonder, I wonder if what we did was has any, you know, what's going to happen. What's behind what we're doing now in staging is getting this process done. And um, there are so many details that have to be uh, attended to. That, that what we're going through now is what n one normally does in, in performance. Um, we've set our course at the beginning, and now what we have to do is make sure that we get to where we're going. So we don't give a lot of thought to overriding questions about um, anything other than how are we going to make it happen. Um, in terms of the, the question of opera as a, a form, I think, it, I think it's all to the good because I think it, it makes it more immediate, and I find as a performer that it's a challenge to engage the audience, even the audience that is interested now, because there is a certain um, passivity that has crept into the, the field of live performance on the part of the audience, the combination of audience and performer, because so much of our um, performance is now absorbed secondhand. The audience files in for a movie and their experience vis-a-vis -vis what's going on stage is or on the screen is one thing and that is what m people are most used to and now they come to a live performance and it takes a while for them to become comfortable with their role in the creative process which is frankly just as important as the performers. Um, this is going to help that. And I'm hoping that what will happen is that we, as performers, will feel that um, resonance, will feel that connection, that immediacy, and will bring it to our future work. Um, and I think if that happens, I'd be very pleased. That would be a good. I, yeah, I see that. That's a, that's a little different than what I was as asking you at the beginning, but I have a feeling that this will be very good for the general question of relevance of opera mm -hmm. to a contemporary audience. 
Bryna, there's a whole series of events um, built around this with the opera as the centerpiece. It's going to be a very rich sequence of, of programs, public programs here. Could you talk about some of the other things you have planned? Sure. Um, we're going to start with a uh, exhibit that will be uh, in the Pape Hall at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. This will be photographs and video from the uh, Nixon Library and Museum in Yorba Linda. Uh, photos of the Nixon Kissinger visit. Uh, some of them are photos of China at the time. Uh, some include photos of some of our speakers who will be coming who are participants in the Nixon Kissinger entourage. Uh, things uh, including uh, some of Haldeman's uh, home videos of Beijing uh, from, his, from the trip. Uh, and one wall of that exhibit will be about um, operatic uh, performances of Nixon in China, uh, including the set designs from the Eugene Opera Performance, which represent a departure. You can see a kind of evolution. Uh, there are correspondences between set designs and iconic photos of the trip. So that um, exhibit space will connect both and also enable Eugene audiences and people at the university to remember that time uh, visually. Uh, some of our events, lectures, uh, will take place in, that, in, the, uh, in the exhibit space, uh, creating a kind of visual frame for um, remembered events. Uh, we'll be bringing um, a, a range of speakers addressing different aspects of the history and also the opera. Um, those include some former participants, um, uh, the journalist uh, Bernard Kolb, who was a part of the entourage, um, the diplomat uh, Nicholas Platt, uh, and uh, the historian Bill Kirby from Harvard, who's written on the international dimensions of the normalization of U.S.-China relations. Uh, they will all uh, present. Uh, we will have um, a lecture and presentation on uh, revolutionary, op revolutionary ballet uh, in the time of the Cultural Revolution, because of course that was the time of the encounter. Uh, the opera has a scene from the revolutionary ballet um, uh, Red Detachment of Women. Pat and Richard Nixon in the opera are watching this revolutionary ballet and sympathize with the heroine <laughs> as she's lashed by someone who looks a lot like uh, uh, Kissinger. Um, we thought it would be good to show the Revolutionary Ballet and uh, uh, political scientist Dick Krauss will talk about uh, revolu model revolutionary culture uh, in that period. Uh, we will have also, uh, we'll invite Roxanne Whitkey, who was the uh, biographer of Mao's wife, Jiang Qing. Jiang Qing has a wonderful aria uh, in the opera, I Am the Wife of Chairman Mao, uh, kind of a shrill, Quite forceful. Uh, <laughs> shrill Quite forceful. aria. Um, uh, and when we bring Roxanne Whitkey to remember um, Jiang Qing, Madame Mao, uh, the soprano uh, from Eugene Opera who will play uh, Madame Mao, um, uh, Rox uh, Laura, Laura Waite. Laura Waite will be talking also about what it means to uh, act this uh, character. We will have a talk on the libretto, which is this wonderful weaving together of um, words that were spoken uh, in Beijing at the time uh, between Nixon, Zhou Enlai, uh, and Mao, and um, Mao's poetry, biblical poetry, uh, a whole range of sources, Chinese and from uh, Western, the Western literary canon. Uh, I'm glad we'll have that unpacking of the libretto because it's an extraordinary uh, libretto. It's uh, by Alice Goodman. Alice Correct. Goodman. Right, yeah, and it's one of the most intrigued pieces of this whole mm -hmm. production. We tried to invite her, but uh, she is a an Anglican rector. Um, uh, 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 campus minister. Yes, uh, a minister at Cambridge. At, at Cambridge, and it's Lent. So <laughs> she was very sorry she, come. she couldn't come. Um, we are bringing Peter Sellers, who was the, the theater director who originally commissioned the opera. Uh, and he, he will be coming to Bell Hall uh, about a week before the performance. Um, uh, what else do we have? We have, um, I think I've given you the major events. Yeah. We may have a, a U.S.-China uh, business panel. Uh, that is, that will happen, that will happen right. um, the, f the week of production. Um, that will happen, uh, we have a mirror uh, lecture to Peter Sellers 
who will, I think, take uh, Nixon and China from its inception. I believe Nixon and China is a brainchild of his. So it will take it from its inception to now. And our participation in that will be a mirror session, which will take uh, our production and talk about the factors that, that have uh, motivated us and, and see where we can take the opera in the future. Um, and the whole, uh, the whole uh, um, collaboration ends in not only the performances, but um, two dinners that will take place downtown um, that will be um, a, uh, Stephanie Pearl Kimmel's take on the menu that was served to Nixon uh, and Mao at the, the Great Hall of the People in China in 1972, which I think is, I mean, it's just a wonderful ending uh, to, a, to uh, an extraordinary and unique collaboration. A actually, the, uh, there are photos of that menu that may be in our exhibit. <laughs> <laughs> of the original menu. There's, there's one, great? one last yeah. potential event that we're mm -hmm. just in the process of organizing. It's a ping pong diplomacy uh, tournament that I'm just beginning to talk to. We have a law school program, uh, a competition, not conflict. And under the um, rubric of that program, I think we will be organizing a, uh, this uh, ping pong diplomacy tournament, which should be This a has lot been of fun. a very rich collaboration, I it's think. Been I mean, a lot it's of fun. It, it's it really has. It's taken out of my, my usual uh, pure history preoccupation. I wish every cultural production in town could be so well supported by yeah. all of this contextual material. It's going to be a wonderful month. Mm -hmm. um, where can viewers find out about everything that's going on, Brenna? Um, ahead, the Mark easiest Mark. place for them to find out would be our website, eugeneopera.com. Eugene we okay. will have a link to a special dedicated website. Uh, which will list the collaboration and, and uh, all the, the, uh, the events. That's great. Okay. I wanted to get back to the production itself, and I don't want to push you on what you're doing differently from the production that people might know from the Met. For oh, example. I can tell you. No, air, you, no, you airplane. Don't mind a no airplane. You don't mind a spoiler, so no, no, airplane. no airplane. Are there other major visual or structural changes that you're planning to make? Um, it's a unit set. Um, it's in the process of being designed now. It's a unit set, um, Can and you it explain is. That? What is a I'm unit I'm sorry. Set? That that means that the. It's not strictly a unit set. A unit set is the curtain goes up and you see something, and that's what you see for the entire production. Um, this is two scenes. There'll be Nixon's arrival, um, which will be handled in a very clever uh, and impressionistic way. Very, actually, quite striking. It will be a very striking visual at the beginning of the opera. And then once we get away from the landing field, then we go into a set that will remain um, basically the same for the rest of the opera. That will be the, the uh, Nixon's, it will serve as the hotel room, it will serve as the banquet hall, um, both before and after the banquet. Um, and that will be, it's a, it's a space that is defined by uh, Chinese uh, looking uh, walls and uh, 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 decorations, so, um, and the various items will come on and off. Uh, spare, uh, sparer than the Mets. Um, they had a lot of money to th throw around, and that's, they were in, that, that was their approach. It was, again, the docu-opera sort of thing, which is, let's make it look as, as authentic and as real as possible, and, and we're, we're not quite there. We're, we're more an impressionistic uh, approach to it. But that's not necessarily a failing or something that's reduced. It gives a different kind of a framework Absolutely. for it, I would Absolutely. think. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, frankly, it's, it, it goes back to our feeling, which is this is the time to do it. Mm -hmm. um, the, I go back to the airplane, and, and, this is, and what I'm referring to is sort of, sort of an iconic visual with this opera, which is the actual arrival of Air Force One on stage. Um, the music certainly reflects it, and you know, in comes the, the plane. Um, I don't think that image resonates anymore the way that it did then. Um, that was an image of, you know, with Nixon and Pat coming out of the plane and the waving at the top of the stairs and coming down. I mean, that, this, we, we ate and drank that uh, then. We don't now. That doesn't mean what it meant then. So there's no reason for us to hold on to it. We're looking at the meaning, a different meaning, the meaning that sort of, uh, I'm trying not to say a better meaning, but it's, it's different because time has passed. So we're, we're trying to find the meaning that is there for us today. When, uh, <coughs> uh, one nice thing about this collaboration is I've gotten to sit in on some of the Eugene Opera 
planning sessions. And so I got to see a, a recent presentation by Sam Helfrich of what precisely they were doing and the, all the set designs. And one of the things that is new about this production that I like very much as a historian is that it begins with a scrim of a Cultural Revolution pol poster. So it brings you right into China at that time. The other productions don't have that. It's a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful device. And because there's so much Cultural Revolution kitsch out there, in a way, it's very recognizable. You know mm -hmm. instantly this is Cultural Revolution China. Uh, and I in a sense, the earlier opera, though it was very focused on photojournalism, it was not so focused on China mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in interesting ways. Yeah. So there are ways in which you do engage that. And it's a reflection of how the work has changed in 40 years, yeah. or 25 years. We're running out of time, so I wanted to ask very briefly, because we've got a, a local and university audience here, Brian, is this going to be a one-time only offering your course, or is this going to be something that you can develop into a course that can stand alone without the opera at the middle of it? Well, my plan is to film everything as much as we can, the speakers. Uh, it would be nice to be able to continue it, but of course, without the opera right there, it, it's harder to have quite the same immediacy. But I love the opera, so I hope uh, if the class works well, uh, then uh, yes, it would be possible to teach it again. That sounds great. And Mark, I know you teach a similar course, or a course dealing with similar issues, very, very briefly. Are you going to be able to talk specifically about your own production in your next Right. Yes, You're actually, teaching it, it, I'm now, teaching it now right? at Notre Dame, yeah. the philosophy uh -huh. of performance, and um, it, we end the course with uh, a look at, at Nixon in China. Um, that's and that, that's a course that, that can be taught and replicated. So. That sounds terrific. I can't wait for all of this to happen, albeit at all. Thank you so Great. much. Thank you, Bryna. Thank you, Mark. Thank, Thank you. you. We've been speaking with Brenna Goodman, Professor of Modern Chinese History, and Mark Buder, Director of Opera Studies at the University of Notre Dame and the General Director of the Eugene Opera. Goodman is teaching a winter term class called What Opera Can Do for History, Nixon in China in History and on Stage, which was developed during her 2011-12 Coleman Guiteau Teaching Fellowship from the Oregon Humanities Center. Buder will sing the role of Chairman Mao in the Eugene Opera's Nixon in China on March 16th and 18th, 2012. Goodman's class and the opera are part of the recognition of the significance of the 40th anniversary of Nixon's historic journey to China. Thank you for watching and see you next time. <laughs>